We're continuing with our decade of tele winners, um, tele winner awards, and this one is going to be on the women's rights movement. That's going to be next on Village Emotion. I've heard it all before And I've been down there on the floor No one's ever gonna keep me down again Well, hello, Greenspring. Uh, today is Monday, August 24th, 2015. I'm Fran Duvall, your host for today. And I'm happy to say I was hosting this show that we're gonna show that happened in 2007, and it caused a... Uh, an award to be given, a tele award to be given. So here we go on the women's rights movement. Stay tuned. Throughout most of history, women generally have had fewer legal rights and career opportunities than men. Wifehood and motherhood were regarded as women's most significant professions. In the 20th century, however, women in most nations won the right to vote, and increased their educational and job opportunities. Perhaps most importantly, they fought for, and to a large degree accomplished, a reevaluation of traditional views of their role in society. Since early times, women have been uniquely viewed as a creative source of human life. Historically, however, they have been considered not only inferior to men, but also a major source of temptation and evil. In Greek mythology, for example, it was a woman, Pandora, who opened the forbidden box and brought plagues and unhappiness to mankind. Nevertheless, when allowed personal and intellectual freedom, women made significant achievements. Whole eras were influenced by women rulers, like Queen Elizabeth of England in the 16th century, Catherine the Great of Russia in the 18th century, and Queen Victoria of England in the 19th century. From the time this nation was founded, women have raised questions about their rights in a free society. Abigail Adams, writing to her husband John in Philadelphia, where he was helping to frame the new laws of the country. In the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants, if they could. If particular care is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion. The women's rights movement officially began on July 13, 1848, when a housewife and mother named Elizabeth Cady Stanton sat down to tea with four female friends and discussed their discontent with the limitations placed upon women in America's new democracy. Two days later, this small group organized what they called, quote, a convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of woman, end quote. This gathering took place in Seneca Falls, New York. The organized woman movement dates from 1848, when a convention to consider the rights of women was held in Seneca Falls, New York. The committee drafting the list of women's wrongs found her grievances against the government of men to be the same number that American men have had against King George. It took George Washington six years to rectify 
men's grievances by war, but it took 72 years to establish women's rights by law. At least 1,000 legal enactments were necessary, and every one was a struggle against ignorant opposition. Women's suffrage is a long story of hard work and heartache crowned by victory. That women should be allowed to vote in elections was almost inconceivable to many and became the topic of heated debates within the women's movement. In fact, even Stanton's longtime friend and fellow proponent of women's rights, Lucretia Mott, had been shocked at the first mention of the idea. It was not until Frederick Douglass, a noted black abolitionist, spoke that the uproar surrounding the vote for women subsided. Women, he proclaimed, like the slave, had the right to liberty. Suffrage, he argued, is the power to choose rulers and make laws and the right by which all others are secured. The women of the Seneca Falls Convention had hoped for a series of meetings embracing every part of the country. This is exactly what happened, as women's rights conventions were held regularly from 1850 until the onset of the Civil War. With the Union victory, women abolitionists hoped their hard work would result in suffrage for women as well as for blacks. But the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, adopted in 1868 and 1870 respectively, granted citizenship and suffrage to blacks, but not to women. During the late 19th century, the women's right movement continued to address the various issues laid out at the Seneca Falls Convention. Women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony traveled the country over the next 40 years to gain support for the movement. Over time, Winning the right to vote emerged as the fundamental issue since the vote would provide the means to achieve the other reforms on their agenda. The struggle to enfranchise women was slow and frustrating. Delegates from the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the NAWSA, had arrived in Washington, D.C. every year since 1869 to present petitions asking that women be granted suffrage. Despite this and the millions of signatures collected, debate on the issue had never even reached the floor of the House of Representatives. In November 1912, as suffrage leaders were looking for new means to ensure their victory, Alice Paul arrived at the NAWSA annual convention in Philadelphia. She had recently returned to the United States, fresh from helping the militant branch of the British suffrage movement. Paul was full of ideas for the American movement. She asked to be allowed to organize a suffrage parade to be held in Washington at a time of President Wilson's inauguration, thus ensuring maximum press attention. Well, Alice Paul was something of a heroine to anybody who had thought that women should have a role in our government and in our society. She had fought long and hard with Susan B. Anthony, Louise Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, all of those early women fighting for the right to vote. You know the story of Susan Anthony. She went to New York and cast a vote for the president. They arrested her and put her in jail for doing that because women are not allowed to vote. That was according to the rules of society back then. By the time the march was to be held, this fledgling committee had organized and found the money for a major suffrage parade with floats, banners, speakers, and a 20-page official program. The total cost of this event was $14,906.08.
a significant sum in 1913 when the average annual wage was only $621. The Women's Suffrage Parade took place on March 3, 1913 and was one of the most dramatic public events in the 72-year struggle to gain women the right to vote. It came at a time when the suffrage movement desperately needed a new way to capture public and media attention. Both women and men alike had come from around the country, quote, to march in a spirit of protest against the present political organization of society from which women were excluded, end quote. Clad in a white cape atop a white horse, a lawyer named Inez Milholland led the great suffrage parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. Behind her stretched a long line with nine bands, four mounted brigades, three heralds, about 24 floats, and more than 5,000 marchers. The procession began late, and all went well the first few blocks. Soon, however, the crowds, mostly men, surged into the street, making it almost impossible for the marchers to pass. Occasionally, only a single file could move forward. Women were jeered, tripped, grabbed, shoved, and withstood verbal insults. Instead of protecting the parade marchers, the police seemed to enjoy all the jokes and laughter, and some participated in them. As one witness explained, quote, there was a sort of spirit of levity connected with the crowd. They did not regard the affair very seriously, end quote. But to the women, the event was very serious. 100 marchers were taken to the local emergency hospital, and before the afternoon was over, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, responding to a request from the Chief of Police, authorized the use of a troop of cavalry from nearby Fort Myer to help control this crowd. Despite enormous difficulties, many of those in the parade completed the route. It is important to note that this struggle to gain women the right to vote was not just unique to the United States. Women's suffrage had been granted and equally revoked at various times in various countries throughout the world. The decision was made to establish the International Alliance of Women and was taken to Washington in 1902 as part of an annual convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. It was originally named the International Women's Suffrage Committee with Susan B. Anthony as president. Its objectives were twofold. One, to secure enfranchisement for the women of all nations by the promotion of women's suffrage and all such other reforms as are necessary to establish a real equality of liberties, status, and opportunities between men and women. And secondly, to urge women to use those rights and influence in public life to ensure that the status of every individual without discrimination of sex, race, or creed shall be based on respect for human personality, the only guarantee for individual freedom. Well, the women's rights movement became important in my life early on. I grew up politically in the 60s in Germany, and so towards the end of the 60s, we had student revolts, lots of protests against the Vietnam War in Germany and in other countries in Western Europe. And that's when I became uh, 
aware of uh, certain patterns and things in society and started conversations with my friends. I was finishing up high school, starting university in 1970. And uh, we came out of the student movement. And out of that, quite automatically, we got into a lot of conversations about gender issues and how come all the student movement activities that were important for male and female students alike were run by guys. And where were we and how were we represented? And then we heard from America, from the United States, that the women's rights movement was uh, up and running there and alive. And so we started uh, doing similar things in Germany. The group continued throughout the First World War. Although members' opinions were divided over the issue of pacifism, with the extension of the franchise to women in a number of countries after the Great War, there was some discussion of disbanding the organization. However, it was decided, divided into franchised and non-franchised sections. The outbreak of the Second World War saw the work falter, though not end. And in 1946, the body reemerged. Since then, it has worked closely with the United Nations. Myself, I uh, came out of high school, so I must have been 18, in 1970, and the, uh, the range of choices of what to do at university or which jobs to go into were very much limited and uh, dis de defined by the fact that I was a woman. Being the first generation after the war in Germany, um, I grew up pretty much with the traditional image of, w image of women being in the house and taking care of uh, raising children, which certainly is an important work but might not necessarily be the only venue for women. In 1920, after the vote was finally won in the United States, the organized women's rights movement continued on in several directions. While the majority of women who had marched, petitioned, and lobbied for women's suffrage looked no further, a minority understood that the quest for women's rights would be an ongoing struggle. Alice Paul was a member of this minority, and in 1923, she drafted the Equal Rights Amendment for the United States Constitution. This amendment stated that equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. It would apply uniformly regardless of where a person lived. In 1966, the National Organization of Women was created for the purpose of bringing about equality for all women. Uh, I first became interested in the women's movement um, when the uh, Equal Rights Amendment was before the Senate and uh, Congress. And a friend of mine called and asked if I would like to go to a meeting of the National Organization of Women. And I accepted, and we, she said, we'd just see what it's all about. So we did that, and um, we immediately joined the group, and there was lots of work to be done. Well, the NOW organization, back then anyway, um, was responsible for um, trying to push the ERA through the uh, states. And so all a lot of women were involved at that time. They uh, did whatever was necessary to do. We worked in the evening because we had small children, uh, and most of the women did not work. But we could go at night. and take care of the mailings and et cetera, things like that. Now was one important group that fought for the Equal Rights Amendment. 
However, opponents of the ERA, organized by Phyllis Shafley, feared that it would give the government too much control over the personal lives of women. It would lead to men abandoning their families, unisex toilets, gay marriage, and women being drafted. One day, one of the men had heard that they were going to interview, that they were going to uh, draft women nurses. And his wife was a nurse, and he said, well, before they uh, draft my wife, uh, she'll be pregnant. And that was really harsh for me. And I thought about it. And so one day, not long after that, on my lunch hour, I went down to the Army recruiting office and enlisted on my lunch hour and came back and told my boss that, uh, that I'd enlisted. And he looked at me and giggled a little bit. And then he said, my God, girl, the only way you'll get out is to get pregnant. Phyllis Shafley, a very strong anti-ERA person, as I, some of you may know, um, was testifying before Congress. I remember those two, remember just two lines. I remember this banner on the corner, two men standing and holding it, and it said, Equal Rights Amendment, dangerous, fraudulent. I think those are very foolish interpretation of what the, e the uh, Equal Rights Amendment was about. The amendment floated around Congress for almost 50 years before it was finally passed and sent to the states for ratification in 1972. To many, ratification seemed to be inevitable. In August, on August 26, 1977, 4,000 people marched up Pennsylvania Avenue in memory of Alice Paul, who had died the previous month. With the death of Alice Paul, who had written the ERA amendment, in July, it was decided to have the August 26, 1977 march, a memorial to Alice Paul. And that's what it was. 4,000 of us rallied across from the archives on the mall. My next door neighbor asked, uh, called me and asked me if I would like to go to the pro-choice ERA march in Washington. Not only did I want to go, but I invited my oldest daughter and her daughter. And the three of us, representing us three generations, went on the march. And it was um, very, a very uh, fulfilling thing for us to do. In an attempt to replicate the suffrage parade of 1913, the procession was led by a rider on horseback and many marchers wore sashes of purple, white, and gold, colors that were chosen by the National Women's Party to symbolize women, women's suffrage. They explained that purple stood for the royal glory of womanhood, white for purity in the home and in politics, and gold for the crown of victory. People also carried original suffrage banners, and some carried new ones made for this march, which showed their support for the ERA. Still, the times had clearly changed. The 1913 parade was often disrupted by unruly opponents, whereas the this march in 1977 passed freely by up the street. In 1913, police had refused to protect the marchers from the crowd. But in 1977, the police provided a motorcycle escort. The purpose of the 1913 march was to make President Wilson pay attention to woman's suffrage. The 1977 purpose was to memorialize Alice Paul and draw attention to her life's work, the Equal Rights Amendment. Let me tell you what the complete text of that Equal Rights Amendment is. It's exactly two lines. It says, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied 
or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's all it says. When the deadline for ratification came in 1982, the ERA was just three states short of the 38 needed to write it into the U.S. Constitution. 75% of the women legislators in those three pivotal states supported the ERA, but only 46% of the men voted to ratify. And thus, to this day, the Equal Rights Amendment has still not been written into the Constitution, even though it has been introduced into every single session of Congress since. It's for me, when you stop and think that Alice Paul introduced this amendment in 1923 in front of 8,000 women, and in 1977, 4,000 women marched to urge ratification. 35 states out of 50 ratified, although five of them changed their minds, of course. We still, we still have that ERA amendment introduced into Congress, and Senator Kennedy and a representative from the House, uh, from the House introduced that one more time in 2007, the ERA amendment that needs to be ratified and put into effect as part of our Constitution. I, you ask, nobody asked me how I feel. I feel rather devastated. Um, well, I just think it's shame on Congress. <laughs> Uh, and I think that in these days, I think women have other things to think about. It's too bad that they, they've drifted away from the power they had in, in trying to enforce this. I think it will eventually be passed. And, and every year it comes up in the uh, Congress. But it doesn't get very far. And uh, maybe things have changed enough now that it won't be so special like it was back then. By that I mean women are now much more active and they're much more uh, out there in the world. So uh, I really can't say how it's going to be, but I still hope that it passes, that they do have it. It is an important piece of legislation and it says to me that we as the women's movement may not have done enough to get it ratified and it says that there are still strong forces out there who'd rather not have women be equal partners. On August 26, 1977, 4,000 people marched up Pennsylvania Avenue in memory of Alice Paul, who had died the previous month. With the death of Alice Paul, who had written the ERA amendment, in July, it was decided to have the August 26, 1977 march, a memorial to Alice Paul. And that's what it was. 4,000 of us rallied across from the archives on the mall. My next door neighbor asked, uh, called me and asked me if I would like to go to the pro-choice ERA march in Washington. Not only did I want to go, but I invited my oldest daughter and her daughter. And the three of us, representing us three generations, went on the march. And it was um, very, a very uh, fulfilling thing for us to do. In an attempt to replicate the suffrage parade of 1913, the procession was led by a rider on horseback, and many marchers wore sashes of purple, white, and gold, colors that were chosen by the National Women's Party. <laughs> 
to symbolize women, woman's suffrage. They explained that purple stood for the royal glory of womanhood, white for purity in the home and in politics, and gold for the crown of victory. People also carried original suffrage banners, and some carried new ones made for this march, which showed their support for the ERA. Still, the times had clearly changed. The 1913 parade was often disrupted by unruly opponents, whereas the, this march in 1977 passed freely by up the street in 1913 Police had refused to protect the marchers from the crowd. But in 1977, the police provided a motorcycle escort. The purpose of the 1913 march was to make President Wilson pay attention to woman's suffrage. The 1977 purpose was to memorialize Alice Paul and draw attention to her life's work, the Equal Rights Amendment. Let me tell you what the complete text of that Equal Rights Amendment is. It's exactly two lines. It says, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's all it says. When the deadline for ratification came in 1982, the ERA was just three states short of the 38 needed to write it into the U.S. Constitution. 75% of the women legislators in those three pivotal states supported the ERA, but only 46% of the men voted to ratify. And thus, to this day, the Equal Rights Amendment has still not been written into the Constitution, even though it has been introduced into every single session of Congress since. It's for me, when you stop and think that Alice Paul introduced this amendment in 1923 in front of 8,000 women, and in 1977, 4,000 women marched to urge ratification. 35 states out of 50 ratified, although five of them changed their minds, of course. We still, we still have that ERA amendment introduced into Congress, and Senator Kennedy and a representative from the House, uh, from the House introduced that one more time in 2007, the ERA amendment that needs to be ratified and put into effect as part of our Constitution. I, you ask, nobody asked me how I feel. I feel rather devastated. Um, well, I just think it's shame on Congress. <laughs> Uh, and I think that in these days, I think women have other things to think about. It's too bad that they, they've drifted away from the power they had in, in trying to enforce this. I think it will eventually be passed. And, and every year it comes up in the uh, Congress. But it doesn't get very far. And uh, maybe things have changed enough now that it won't be so special like it was back then. By that I mean women are now much more active and they're much more uh, out there in the world. So uh, I really can't say how it's going to be, but I still hope that it passes, that they do have it. It is an important piece of legislation and it says to me that we as the women's movement may not have done enough to get it ratified, and it says that there are still strong forces out there who'd rather not have women be equal partners. Despite this hurdle, there were several federal laws passed during the 1960s which were aimed at improving the economic status of women. 
The Equal Pay Act of 1963 required equal wages for men and women during doing equal work. Yet, in 1970, women were paid about 45% less than men for the same jobs. And in 1988, about 32% less. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed which prohibited discrimination against women by any company with 25 or more employees. In 1967, a presidential executive order prohibited bias against women in hiring by federal government contractors. Still, working women often face discrimination in the mistaken belief that because they were married, or would most likely get married, they would not be permanent workers. However, married women generally continued on their jobs for many years and were not a transient, temporary, or undependable workforce. From 1960 to the early 1970s, the influx of married women workers accounted for almost half the increase in the total labor force, and women were working longer before starting families. Working was not new to women, especially those among racial minorities and lower income. However, the culture of the times ideally placed white middle-class women in the home and men in the workforce. Two, because of high unemployment during the Depression, most people were against women working, seeing it as taking the jobs away from men. The latter part of the 20th century has seen expanded opportunities for all women in the workplace. The start of World War II tested the preconceived notions of woman's place being in the home. Everyone agreed that workers, even if they were women, were greatly needed. When the United States entered the war, 12 million women were already working, and by the end, the number was up to 18 million. Almost 300,000 women served in the armed forces, performing many non-combatant jobs I came to Washington in 1941 as a government girl, along with thousands of other girls. And uh, I was a clerk typist. In fact, back home in West Virginia, I was the uh, chief clerk of the rationing board. And uh, I came to Washington as a clerk typist. I came to Washington as one of the government girls uh, to work for the FBI which I did in 1941, and I worked there until I met my husband and got married. One day, one of the men had heard that they were going to interview, that they were going to uh, draft women nurses, and his wife was a nurse, and he said, well, before they uh, draft my wife, uh, she'll be pregnant. And that was really harsh for me, and I thought about it, and so one day, not long after that, on my lunch hour, I went down to the Army recruiting office and enlisted on my lunch hour and came back and told my boss that, uh, that I had enlisted. And he looked at me and giggled a little bit. And then he said, my God, girl, the only way you'll get out is to get pregnant. And for 1941, I thought that was pretty uh, rough material. But anyway, and he never spoke to me until the day I went into the Army. While patriotism did influence women, ultimately it was the economic incentives that convinced them to work. Once at work, they discovered the more intangible benefits, such as learning new skills, contributing to the public good, and proving themselves in jobs once thought of as men's only work. Thus, women began to take a greater role in society. For example, many woman, women began to serve in all branches of federal and state governments, the legislature as representatives and senators, 
the executive as cabinet secretaries and department heads, and the judiciary as local and Supreme Court judges. Many women took advantage of opportunities to become educated. In the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century, less than 20% of all college degrees were earned by women. By the end of the 20th century, this figure had risen to about 50%. In the last three decades of the 20th century, American women realized a new freedom in medical advances, helping them control if and when they would have children. Birth control enabled women to plan their adult lives, often making way for both career and family. We have a great deal to be proud of today in the United States. Not only have women won the right to vote, they are being elected to public office at all levels in greater numbers, have taken ownership over their reproductive rights, serve with distinction in the military, even in combat. Activities all unheard of at the time Elizabeth Cady Stanton penned her Declaration of Sentiments. We've accomplished a great deal but a lot of work still remains. In some developing nations, women continue to be denied basic rights. Through the United Nations and its agencies, as well as many other independent groups concerned with the fair treatment of all people, the role of women in the world continues to evolve. How things have changed since I was a young woman in Germany. I think there are several ways that we see change. We certainly see change in young women today. They have a completely different level of self-confidence. They have an understanding of the world that is open to them in so many more ways than it was to us then. They take for granted, which can be dangerous, the existence of a house for battered women. They take for granted the availability of um, birth control methods. They take it uh, for granted the existence of women's bookstores, women's everything. So their understanding of women in the world and women as an active part and contributing part of society is much more comprehensive than it was for us. And when you think about it now, uh, you read the business section of the paper, how many women are the heads of uh, uh, corporations and uh, banks and things like that. Uh, we've, we've come a, a long, long way. When you, when you stop and think about this current generation and we talk about equal rights and everything, one of the problems is, is kind of like talking about the Vietnam War. Out of sight, out of mind. <clears throat> I think a lot of the <clears throat> Uh, prior battles for equal rights have kind of gone down the river, floating away, and are accepted or taken for granted. And it's only on something like this when we're celebrating uh, a memorial march for Alice Paul that we pause to think about our past war. I've seen the uh, things change for women. Um, considerably, uh, mostly in the military, mostly in the, uh, there are a lot more people, women who work now, that never worked. Uh, women mostly didn't work before, they do that now. They still have not reached the level of pay they should be granted, but that will come, I hope. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed watching that. I hope you were able to. Let me tell you what's going to happen Monday. Uh, well, that's today, yes. Uh, we will have a show on Vivian Watts uh, at 2 and 8 p.m. Um, the special programming at 5 and 9 will be the Catholic Mass. Tuesday, tomorrow on Village Emotion, Mr. Rogers, February 2008. 
And we'll, of course, have that brain teaser. Feature programming, the Steve Kubak Travel Log, Tuesday and Thursday at 2 and 8, and the Village Church, Tuesday 5 and 9. Uh, stay tuned now for our um, Spotlight on History. Bye now. I am woman, hear me roar In numbers too big to ignore And I know too much to go back and pretend Cause I've heard it all on history. August, I'm Tom Williams. On August 4th, 1944, acting on a tip from a Dutch informer, the Nazi Gestapo located 15-year-old Jewish diarist Anne Frank and her family in a secret annex area of an Amsterdam warehouse. The Franks had hidden there in 1942 out of fear of deportation to a Nazi concentration camp. They occupied the small space with another Jewish family and a single Jewish man and were aided by Christian friends who brought them food and supplies. Anne passed the time in hiding, writing in her diary. The diary survived the war, overlooked by the Gestapo that discovered the family, but Anne and nearly all of the others were lost in the Nazi death camps. For two years, and kept a diary about her life in hiding that is marked with poignancy, humor, and insight. The door to the secret annex was hidden by a hinged bookcase, and former co-workers of Anne's father, Otto, delivered them food and supplies at high risk to themselves. Anne and the others lived in blacked-out rooms, never even flushed the toilet during the day due to the noise. In June 1944, Anne's spirits soared due to the invasion of Nazi-occupied Normandy, and she was hopeful that the long-awaited liberation of Holland would soon begin. On August 1st, 1944, Anne made her last entry in her diary. Three days later, 25 months after hiding, ended with the arrival of the Gestapo. On August 12, 1990, fossil hunter Susan Hendrickson spied three gigantic bones protruding from a cliff near Faith, South Dakota. They turned out to be the largest ever Tyrannosaurus X uh, skeleton that we've ever discovered, a 65 million year old specimen that was named Sue after its discoverer. Amazingly, Sue's skeleton was over 90% intact, and the bones were extremely well preserved. Hendrickson's employer, the Black Hills Institute of Geological Research, put up $5,000 to the landowner, Maurice Williams, for permission to evacuate the, the dinosaur, which was cleaned and moved to their headquarters in Hill City. The Institute's president, Peter Larson, Ex proposed plans to construct a nonprofit museum to exhibit Sioux along with other fossils of the Cretaceous period. In 1992, a long legal battle began over Sioux. The United States Attorney's Office claimed that Sioux's bones had been taken from federal land and were United States government property. It was eventually found at Williams part Native American and a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe, had bartered his land to the, uh, to, to, the tri uh, to the tribe 20 years earlier to avoid paying taxes. And consequently, his sale of excavation rights to Black Hills had been invalid. So in October 1997, Chicago's Field Museum bought Sioux at auction at Southby's in New York City for $8.3 million with the financial aid of the McDonald's and Disney corporations. <laughs>
On August 18, 1991, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev was placed under house arrest during a coup by senior members of his own government, as well as military and police forces. The coup was orchestrated by hardline elements within the Gorbachev administration, as well as the heads of the CGB or secret police. Cornered at his vacation villa in Crimea, he was pressured to give his resignation, which he refused. Reporting Gorbachev was ill, the coup leaders, led by former Vice President Gennady Yanayev, declared a state of emergency and tried to seize the government. Gorbachev was released and flown to Moscow, but his re uh, regime had been dealt a deadly blow. Over the next few months, he dissolved the Communist Party, granted independence to the Baltic states, and proposed a looser, more economics-based uh, federation among the remaining republics. In December 1991, Gorbachev resigned. Boris Yeltsin capitalized on his defeat of the coup, merging from the rubble of the former Soviet Union as one of the most powerful figures in Moscow and the leader of the newly formed Commonwealth of Independent States. <coughs> On August 27, 1883, the most powerful volcanic eruption in recorded history occurred on Krakatau, also called Krakatoa, a small and uninhabited volcanic island located west of Sumatra in Indonesia. It was heard 3,000 miles away, and the explosions threw five cubic miles of earth 50 miles into the air. Granted, uh, created 20-foot tsunamis and killed 36,000 people. On August 26th and 7th, excitement turned to horror as Krakatau literally blew itself apart, settling, setting off a chain of natural disasters that would be felt around the world for years to come. An enormous blast on the afternoon of August 26th destroyed the northern two-thirds of the island as it plunged into the Sunda Strait between the Java Sea and Indian Ocean, the gushing mountain generating a series of pyroclastic flows, which are fast-moving fluid bodies of molten gas, ash, and rock, and monstrous tsunamis that swept over nearby coastlines. Four more eruptions beginning at 5.30 a.m. the following day proved cataclysmic. The explosions could be heard as far as 3,000 miles away, and ash was propelled to a height of 50 miles. Fine dust from the explosion drifted around the earth, causing spectacular sunsets and forming an atmospheric veil that lowered temperatures worldwide by several degrees. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time in Spotlight on History.